All right, so I request the attention of all the respected faculties and delegates. Good evening and welcome to one and all. I'm Ankita from Clanet, the designated session assistant for a seamless experience. And Clanet is India's most trusted and widely used Digitech platform with multiple enriching services exclusively for doctors. Clanet is very proud to be a digital partner for this webinar organized by Cancer Key Strength of Smiles Doctors Network, Maharashtra. Based on the topic, Lecture 7, Approach to Malignant Thoracic Muscles in Children. So, without any further delay, I would like to hand over the session to Dr. Monika Bhagat, ma'am. So, over to Am I audible? Right now you're audible, ma'am. Kindly proceed with your talk. So I'm handing over the session to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ankita. Can you please uh, share the screen? Yes, ma'am. It's already been shared, ma'am. Um, Ankita, can you move to the next slide? Yeah. So good evening, everyone. So, uh, so starting today's se session, which is uh, media channel tumors in children. So we, I uh, welcome Dr. Venkat Ram, Ram from uh, uh, Tata Memorial Hospital. He is an assistant professor there in Division of Pediatric Oncology. He is very much interested in neuro-oncology, pediatric solid tumors, and uh, is also interested in survivorship clinic, which is he's uh, working in um, ACT clinic in TMH. Uh, Dr. Ram, you can start. I hope you have joined. Yes, yes, I did. Am I audible? Yes, you're audible. Ankita, you'll have to stop screen sharing. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. It's done, ma'am. Yeah. Just share my screen. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Uh, hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, today, uh, as you know, the session is on uh, approach uh, to mediastinal masses. So we are going to talk about how do we approach a child with a mediastinal mass when you see them coming into your clinic. So as we all know, mediastinal masses constitute like one of the most common uh, emergencies that we encounter in day-to-day -day oncology practice. And most of the times we know that it is an emergency. We need to handle the, we need to deliver the emergent care. And simultaneously, we need to establish the diagnosis at the earliest so that we can start the definitive treatment, which is going to control the symptoms uh, uh, early. So the diagnosis is predominantly based on symptomatology and the imaging characteristics. And sometimes we do have certain surrogate markers like tumor markers, which are going to be adjuncts in our diagnosis and thereby arrive in a diagnosis. So a significant proportion of patients of mediastinal mass is present with symptoms rather than being detected asymptomatic. And a proportion of these uh, patients uh, who present with uh, symptoms uh, do land up is, as uh, oncological emergencies, which, which we are all quite aware of, which range from vascular compression symptoms, which is more commonly like more popularly known as superior vena cavall syndrome, uh, whereas airway compression symptoms, which can present as respiratory distress, frank respiratory distress, or certain maneuvers might actually exacerbate this respiratory distress. And together <clears throat> with vascular compression, it is called as superior mediastinal syndrome. Following this, there are other kinds of emergencies which are linked to this uh, mediastinal mass, like tumor lysis syndrome, by the virtue of it being a highly rapidly growing malignancy like a leukemia or a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma where you might see the child presenting to you with tumor lysis or hyperleukocytosis, once again, uh, describing the biology of this kind of a leukemia which presents with a mediastinal mass, respiratory distress. Along with that, there is a high tumor burden in the form of high cell count in the peripheral blood. And we do see effusions, which might be secondary to the vascular effects or might be even malignant effusions. And the consequences of these effusions, which include both pericardial and pleural effusions. 
So classified classification of this mediastinal mass is typically whenever you present the patient to your senior, to your consultant, or whenever you're going to work this patient up, you immediately think about what are the possibilities. And the first thing what we look at is where exactly is this mediastinal mass? So where it is located, whether it is in the anterior, middle, or posterior mediastinum. I'll go in detail uh, regarding these aspects uh, in my further talk. So basic outline approach of a patient who presents to you with mediastinal mass, you tend to take a short focused history and then do a physical examination, which again is going to look for both etiology and also to know the gravity of these symptoms, which are being presented by the uh, mediastinal mass. And we take into account the age of the child, the gender of the child, which play a key role in knowing uh, the possible differentials and the duration of the symptoms and what signs that we can see. And along with all this, we tend to localize this lesion within the chest, whether it belongs to which compartment. And this is done predominantly by symptom symptomatology and imaging. And adding to this, we have the laboratory investigations, which give us clue to the diagnosis. Before we move on to the approach of the mediastinal masses, uh, we can have a quick look at the mediastinum, how it looks like. So we do have, I mean, this is something which we are all familiar and it's just a brush up where we have mediastinum divided into superior mediastinum, anterior, middle and posterior. So here the divisions are uh, predominantly what we look at while we are imaging and trying to find a diagnosis is whether this mass is in the anterior mediastinum, which is uh, anterior to the visceral structures, that's the heart and the great vessels. Uh, which is also called, called as prevascular mediastinum. You have the middle mediastinum, which contains the cardiac structures. And behind the cardiac, cardiac structures, we have a posterior mediastinum, which is opposed between the anterior surface of the anterior margin of the vertebral body and the posterior margin of the cardiac structures. So the contents of individual compartments is something important that we should be aware of because those are the ones which are going to uh, give rise to the tumors later. So here we have the superior mediastinum, which is bound by the inlet of the thoracic uh, cavity. And then there you have uh, imaginary line that we draw from the sternal angle to the T4 vertebra <clears throat> from our anatomy. And this is the place where you have contents include the great vessels, which are there. There, there is like thyroid, which can extend into this area. And there is thymus. And then moving on to the anterior mediastinum, which is in front of the heart, anterior to the heart, where we have structures like thymus, lymph nodes, and you can see uh, like other vessels or else even you can see thyroidal tissue, which is extending into the, uh, into the thoracic uh, cavity, which is not that often. Then moving on to the media, med middle mediastinum, here you encounter the pericardium, the heart, the major blood vessels. And the posterior mediastinum is a uh, place where you see that you have uh, other vasculature like the descending aorta, as I goes, as I goes, and uh, esophagus. And most importantly, we see the sympathetic chain, which is there in this location, which can uh, give rise to certain tumors. So the diagnostic possibilities will rely predominantly on what anatomical structures are lying within these cavities. So these include in the anterior mediastinum, commonly we end up seeing lymphomas and germ cell tumors. Uh, whereas in posterior mediastinum, we tend to see more neurogenic tumors like uh, neurogenic tumors or otherwise we can see tumors which are coming from the neural crest that is uh, neuroblastoma or else we can see bone tumors like Ewing sarcoma. Where a middle mediastinum, more of cardiac tumors or soft tissue sarcomas or lymphomas. So further, apart from malignant causes, we can also have non-malignant possibilities like where you can include these developmental abnormalities like developmental cysts or hyperplasia or cystic hygroma. These are certain uh, benign conditions which we encounter as pediatricians. Also, we can come up with those conditions like hernias, which we can see diaphragmatic hernias, which are uh, moving into the thoracic cavity. So... When I encounter a patient with mediastinal mass, so the first thing which we would look at is what are the clinical manifestations, thereby they are going, you are going to take a quick call, what am I supposed to do immediately before I end up completing my evaluation. So the most important thing is these local effects that you see in the mediastinum. So the 
uh, chest treasure certain uh, important organs of our body like the heart lungs and the spine which goes through so which are prone for these local effects when you have a, a neoplastic lesion within this thoracic cavity so the first moving on to the first set of symptoms include venous obstruction which is called as superior vena cava syndrome where the superior vena cava almost like drains 35% of the blood supply to uh, the heart and then compression of this uh, structure might lead to suffusion of the face you might see edema you might see a, a, a hue over the face and the cyanotic appearance so these are the features which you classically see whenever you see there is a vascular compression you might as well see there are like engorged veins, uh, which are the collaterals over the chest wall. Then the second set of symptoms, uh, which include the airway compression symptoms. So airway compression is classically seen in anterior uh, mediastinal masses, where this sign is better elicited when you ask the history, where child clearly, if it's an older child, he can say that while he lies down, he starts coughing or he is, feels extremely uncomfortable. Whereas you can see that child uh, leaning forwards while sitting, if there is like a critical airway obstruction. So apart from the mass obstructing it, even the venous engorgement in these small airways, which you can see that that leads to edematous airways on thereby furthermore precipitating this uh, airway compromise. So together with superior vena cava syndrome, if you have airway compression, it is called as superior mediastinal syndrome. So this would alert you to quickly start uh, uh, the best, uh, quickly secure the airway, then uh, uh, IV access and start the emergent management. Apart from these venous and respiratory compromise, adding on to this, you can have effusions. These effusions include pericardial and pleural effusions. So these can further exacerbate this cardiorespiratory compromise, be it bringing down the further cardiac output by causing a tamponade in case of pericardial effusion or the pleural effusions causing further worsening distress. Then moving on to the other local uh, uh, effects that you can see with these mediastinal masses, typically with posterior mediastinal masses, you can see that there can be, the mass can have an intraspinal extension causing extra medullary cord compression and they might manifest with <clears throat> motor weakness in this in this case or else you can even see cervical cord getting involved and then you can see Horner syndrome apart from the local effects we, we should definitely look for the constitutional symptoms because some of these mediastinal masses are known to be causing systemic manifestations classical examples being leukemias uh, non-hodgkin's lymphoma al also certain solid tumors like high-risk neuroblastoma and even sarcoma so moving on to the ideological workup of mediastinal masses, starting off with the history where we see the age. So the age helps us in trying to narrow down certain possibilities. For example, younger the age of the child, I would think more uh, to bring neuroblastoma higher up on the cards, knowing that neuroblastoma is common in infancy in younger age group. Also, more and more we uh, practice pediatric oncology. We are not surprised to see patients with mediastinal GCTs or even TALs presenting at a younger age, but we should uh, always put uh, the age as an important thing where we can narrow down our etiology. Moving on to the older age, you see more and more of hematolymphoid malignancies like leukemias, non-Hodgkin's and even Hodgkin's lymphoma at a later uh, age. And again, in the uh, older age group where you see adolescents, you can see mediastinal germ cell tumors, and you can also see even sarcomas and also sarcomas, soft tissue sarcomas. So the duration of the symptoms is one thing which we tend to give value to because a rapid onset etiology and uh, then presenting with such rapid onset uh, respiratory distress makes, them, makes us more worried and we would like to start treatment early for these kind of patients uh, due to, uh, we know that there's an underlying uh, high-grade malignancy which is there, which is more often seen with uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma or a leukemia like uh, TLBL or TALL, which are the best example where you can see or else you can have a Burkitt also in a mediastinum, not so common site, but yes, definitely we can see. Then the other uh, uh, symptoms which we should look for on uh, uh, further examination include, we should look for the signs of cytopenias. Often we have to look for any signs of bone marrow aplasia, like uh, uh, repeated transfusion requirements for uh, anemia, progressive pallor. Then also to look for any bleeding manifestations, 
uh, be it mucocutaneous uh, bleeding manifestations, these will point us more towards leukemia. Then organ infiltration in the form of hepatosplenomegaly, which again point us more towards uh, hematolymphoid cause. Proptosis, one key uh, symptom, if we, uh, symptom sign which we can see that if there is proptosis, which would indicate us uh, towards certain diagnosis. One such diagnosis is neuroblastoma, where you can expect the child to present with a mediastinal mass. Along with that, the child can present with proptosis. So that's one important clue. So also the leukemias can cause proptosis, but less often you see with lymphoblastic leukemia, which presents as a mediastinal mass, rather proptosis is more seen with myeloid malignancies. Here comes the next uh, set of things which you should be looking for. The other things which have previously uh, stressed upon on head to toe, where we should look for other lymphadenopathy, which is an important thing because mediastinal masses coexisting with lymphadenopathy, this can not just have a, a, a you know, importance where you come to draw conclusions and come to, you know, uh, what possible differentials, but also it can be an easy access site in order to attain uh, the histopathological diagnosis. So, here we have other uh, symptoms which we all have to elicit, which include like bleeding manifestations, then we have to look for recurrent infections, then where there is any weakness uh, in any of the uh, lower limbs uh, or upper limbs, any weakness, uh, looking for signs of uh, Horner syndrome, proptosis, uh, obsoclonus, myoclonus ataxia. So OMAS can actually present as a, a neurodevelopmental regression in a very young child or a developmental delay with abnormal eye movements. So these are the pointers which we need to try to elicit in a very young child when we have a, a neuroblastoma in a differential. Then uh, moving on to uh, the other aspects that is laboratory parameters. So the laboratory parameters where here is one diagnosis where you want to rely more on ancillary uh, laboratory parameters in the initial stages so that you can uh, come to a, uh, a possible diagnosis at the earliest and thereby you can start treatment. And some of the times we can clinch the diagnosis just by these uh, ancillary labs. Importantly, we look for uh, any cytopenias or leukocytosis. We look for peripheral uh, blood, peripheral smear to look for any possible uh, abnormal cells to uh, narrow down leukemia. Then we should definitely look for tumor lysis parameters, which is a known oncological uh, emergency, which is associated with, which you see with along with mediastinal masses. Moving on to LDH, LDH, higher LDH might actually give a clue that whether it is a very aggressive tumor like a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, be it a TLBL or a leukemia, or it can be even a other NHLs. And you might as well see it high even in certain germ cell tumors. Then, uh, especially the anterior mediastinal masses is uh, those group of masses where you would do AFP and beta HCG. These can clinch, help you and clinch the diagnosis and start definitive treatment and actually preclude the need for biopsy. And moving on to imaging, the First investigation that we do is chest X-ray. Chest X-ray is a very good indicator to tell us, uh, to confirm our uh, diagnosis of a mediastinal mass. And then we will look for how critically the airway is uh, uh, obstructed. And then we can look uh, whether there is any uh, effusions which are there in the uh, pleural cavities. So, so that we can even relieve certain amount of respiratory distress by draining these fluid. Also by using this as a... <clears throat> Uh, uh, medium for our diagnosis, whereas fluids themselves can help us in uh, uh, diagnosing the child, establishing the diagnosis in this child. So uh, CT is not usually performed in every patient. So it is reserved for certain conditions. Best example is in leukemias. Most of the time we establish diagnosis with these basic investigations where we do blood tests, we run blood tests, and then we, the blood test might itself pick up that it's nothing but a T acute lymphoblastic leukemia, one of the common causes of mediastinal mass. So we may not do it for every patient. So it is usually reserved for those patients when we don't get any diagnosis where it is not a common leukemia that we are looking at. So here we might go and do a CT to establish further characteristics of the tumor where we have, uh, uh, we do not arrive at diagnosis at this level. But the other thing is the CT has a value where we are planning for a biopsy of the tumor where it is causing critical obstruction, uh, where we can, uh, it helps us in better understanding the predicting the possibility that the child might have a, uh, a, a how uh, difficult it is going to be uh, when you plan for a biopsy. 
moving on to the definitive investigation. So uh, for germ cell tumors, the tumor markers themselves might be definitive investigations. The others being biopsy, the biopsy is we tend to reserve it for the later time point. So we tend to look at the tumor markers, then we tend to look at the peripheral blood for any clue, but then we will tend to see whether we, there are any effusions which are there, which we can tap and send it for close cytometry, which can establish the diagnosis, cytology, malignant cytology, which can establish the diagnosis. If none of them turn uh, uh, like, a pro, which help us in establishing a diagnosis, then we might move on to bone marrow, uh, aspiration and biopsy when there is uh, a hematolymphoid tumor, which is higher on the cards. Uh, the, when we have to do a biopsy, then uh, ideally we tend to look at any peripheral lymph nodes which look clinically diseased, which we can biopsy, excision biopsy, for example, there are any cervical nodes which we can biopsy and establish the diagnosis. Else, then we would proceed with the mediastinal mass. Nature, so, and just to interrupt, we have a, a team of two surgeons and anesthesia team waiting for you to finish. Sure. Thank you. So, uh, so as we all know, that the principles include like we should try the least invasive method with minimal possible sedation and anesthesia, and while maintaining spontaneous ventilation. As we know that the obstruction in a mediastinal mass patient might not be at the level which you can tackle by intubation, which might be further down. So that's why we would try to avoid muscle relaxants and make it as minimal as possible the anesthesia and sedation. Uh, moving on to, uh, these are a few images. I think the, there would be more images that would be uh, discussed at a later time point. Here we have uh, typically a 13-year-old child who's presented with chest pain, progressive breathing difficulty, tumor markers were normal, and imaging was uh, possibility included lymphoma. So here, if you don't have any peripheral blood, which is suggestive, then you would go for a biopsy if there is no other method to establish. Here, the second case, uh, which I just wanted to put was where imaging helped us in finding that this is looking like a heterogeneous mass with uh, uh, necrotic cystic spaces in the anterior mediastinum, and then the tumor markers clinch the diagnosis. Uh, lastly, one more posterior mediastinal mass, uh, which can which you can see that it has got an interspinal extension and cord compression manifested in this child, where there is MRI and also an image of the CT that has been put and later turned out to be a neuroblastoma, where we can start the emergent management. Lastly, emergent management principles include hematological uh, uh, abnormalities when we detect, we, try, we treat the hyperleukocytosis, which treats the mediastinal mass too. So we do cytoreduction, start, starting steroids, and the steroid of choice would be dexamethasone, which ranges people start, uh, which we might start anywhere ranging from six to 10 mg per meter square, and then um, moving and supporting the cytopenias, whatever transfusion requirement is needed. Then uh, moving on to metabolic uh, causes, uh, metabolic problems which exist along with this uh, tumors, tumor lysis managed and local effect management is importantly propped up position, left lateral position, uh, establishing an IV axis where uh, most of the centers would prefer doing it in the lower limb to decrease uh -huh. the load. Finally, fluid management, not to check that we should not overload these patients and uh, starting steroids early and emergent chemo uh, is usually the first line. Ankita, please mute everyone else except Dr. Ram. Moving on to uh, the management of effusions, uh, pigtailing or insertion of ICDs, which has got both diagnostic and therapeutic value. And uh, cord compression, we should uh, quickly start steroids in the golden uh, arm and quickly start steroids and emergent chemotherapy, if not responded, to move on to emergent radiation and surgery. Thank you. It was really good. And I'm sorry I interrupted you in between. Uh, Dr. Saha, I'll be sharing screen so that you can um, introduce our next speaker. Yeah, good evening, everyone. So our next speaker is, is Dr. Harik B. Shah. He's the consultant in SRCC Children's Hospital, Mumbai. He is a MD anesthetist along with has a DM, DNB and DM in pediatric anesthesia. So I'm special interest in the pediatric regional anesthesia and pain management. Being a surgeon, it is uh, we have to have to depend on the anesthesia because when we are dealing with a mediastinal tumor, we have to follow some rules and we have to be very 
good with the Anastasia team. Otherwise, uh, we can't do our job successfully. Please well, uh, welcome Dr. Hari B. Hello. Uh, good evening, everyone. Am I audible? Yeah. Yes. All right. So I'm Dr. Harik. I'm uh, associate consultant in pediatric anesthesia. Uh, so I'll be talking about the anesthesia considerations. So just a second, sharing my slide. Uh, is it visible to everyone? Hello. Yes, started. All right. Thank you. So, uh, as an anesthetist, uh, any patient with mediastinal mass, so the need for anesthesia arises for uh, either sedation uh, or general anesthesia. So, sedation is primarily for imaging, whether you want to get a CT. So, if you have a cooperative child, well and good, but if you have a smaller child who's not going to cooperate, for that you require some sort of sedation uh, for radiotherapy or a diagnostic biopsy. Again, diagnostic biopsy, older child, if cooperative, can be done under local, which is the best option. If not, we may need to give some amount of sedation so the biopsy can be done. And then next comes general anesthesia, where you want to do a procedure, uh, remove the mask, so which includes your metastinoscopy, uh, video-assisted thoracoscopy, thoracotomy, sternotomy, a biopsy. So the considerations are uh, same, whether you're giving sedation, whether you're doing general anesthesia. Sedation, all the more risky because you're, uh, you'll be doing it in a remote location where you'll not have much help, not have much equipment related to anesthesia. Then uh, coming to preoperative assessment, I think Dr. Venkatram has major, uh, covered majority of it considering all the symptoms which we look for, the examination and everything. So I'll just brush through it. The uh, respiratory symptom which we look for, dyspnea, tachypnea, noisy breathing, cough, uh, decreased breath sounds. Uh, usually symptoms, in a, if it, the mass is large and the anterior mediastinum will probably, uh, the symptoms would worsen in a certain position. Kids may not be able to lie down or probably preferably would be lying down in one position either on each lateral side and you know, the children usually present earlier because they have a smaller tracheal diameter and as we know if the diameter is smaller the chances of obstruction are higher then uh, coming to cardiovascular system we look for svc syndrome due to obstruction of venous drainage in the upper thorax then cns symptoms headache visual disturbance ment altered mentation all this is because of dilated collateral veins in the upper body, edema. Then there, uh, if the heart and the pulmonary vesicle compression is there, you can have dyspnea, syncope, arrhythmias. So all these symptoms we uh, look for before, uh, during our preoperative assessment. Then again, imaging uh, CT and uh, we do a transthoracic echo. Transthoracic echo is primarily to rule out any involvement of cardiovascular structure and to rule out pericardial effusion. And CT scan actually is the most important along with surgeon for us because we want to know the size, uh, the extent location extent of the mass in relation to the tracheobronchial tree and whether it is compressing the major cardiovascular structures and we would also like to know the airway diameter in case there is an obstruction decrease in the airway diameter uh, because our tube sizes also depend so we should be able to negotiate the tube ideally we would want the distal diameter of the end of the tube beyond the mass so that we can ventilate the patient well so these are a few photos uh, which we have seen in our patient where you can see in the first slide there is some tracheal compression, uh, the anterior posterior compression and this is where you can actually see the carina is involved. The mass is exactly at the carina so you can definitely not ventilate one part of the lung. So this is where we prefer cardiopulmonary bypass along with anesthesia. So this is an eco photo showing pericardial, uh, large pericardial effusion. And this another CT photo where it shows, you can see that is encasement of the tumor, uh, encasing the pulmonary artery and all those vessels around it. So in anesthesia, what we say in patients with mediastinal mass, there is no one individual symptom or test that will accurately forewarn one of complications during anesthesia. However, we have a certain uh, predictive uh, signs and symptoms and imaging findings. Uh, so signs and symptoms which include uh, orthopnea, then there is cuff when supine, strider, wheeze, syncopal symptoms, upper body edema. And in imaging, that if there is reduction of more than 70% in the tracheal cross-section, carinal or bronchial compression, great vessel compression, and pericardial effusion. If, if, if these are uh, present in the patient, there's an increase in patient undergoing general anesthesia. So after uh, review, the patient has three options. Uh, 
a diagnostic procedure if it is to be done under local anesthesia plus minus sedation. We can have a pre-treatment with chest radiation, corticosteroids and, uh, to reduce the size of the mass prior to general anesthesia and third is general anesthesia to perform the procedure. So the most important uh, part when there's a mediastinal mass or particularly an anterior mediastinal mass is uh, the loss of tone which happens while inducing general anesthesia. So both neuromuscular blocking agents and the general anesthetic like propofol, they tend to reduce the tone of both the major airway and vascular structures. So this can cause both physical and mechanical compression of major structures. Tracheal compression can lead to complete airway obstruction and compression of major vessels can exaggerate the negative inotropic effects of general anesthesia. So the trick is to maintain spontaneous ventilation until the airway is definitely secured in a safe, and that is the most safe and popular approach. Tracheal intubation under deep inhalational or intravenous anesthesia may maintain a normal transpulmonary pressure gradient and thus it reduces the risk of major airway compression. We can also use local anesthetic spray or give a transtracheal block which will anesthetize the trachea and uh, hence we can decrease the use of uh, anesthetic agents and also prevent laryngospasm. Also, we tend to keep the head of head end of the bed elevated, which uh, which helps in uh, cephalic displacement of the diaphragm and helps uh, reduction helps uh, to decrease the reduction in the functional residual capacity. And in very severe cases, anesthesia induction may be done in sitting or inclined position, and airway secured using a fiber optic bronchoscope. The loss of uh, major uh, airway tone. So we have three options if we suddenly lose the airway and not able to ventilate. The first and foremost is we reposition. So this is this is what we want to know preoperatively before inducing the patient that what is the most comfortable for the in which position the patient is most comfortable. So that we try to keep the patient in that position. Second is rigid bronchoscopy. Say even after maneuvering the when uh, the patient, we are not able to ventilate the patient. The rigid bronchoscopy is the best, which will help uh, uh, lift up the mask and decrease the compression of the trachea. And if this doesn't help, then we need the surgeons need to step in and do an emergency sternotomy and physically uh, lift the mask of the airway. Then uh, certain other anesthesia considerations are uh, because of SVC obstruction, there is possibility of excessive bleeding. Uh, usually we put uh, invasive lines, uh, central venous lines, so there can be uncertainty of drug delivery and also possibility of airway swelling and strider during emergence and after the surgery. Uh, cases where say the mass is at the carina or uh, encasing the major uh, vessels or around the heart, we uh, have a cardiopulmonary bypass is considered. And it can also be used where the tumor is compressing the right heart, pulmonary artery. Other considerations are uh, patients can also have difficult airway, not because of the mass, but if there are other neck, neck nodes or other oral, legion, uh, oral masses, then these patients usually have undergone chemotherapy. There is a risk of mucositis and this may lead to difficult airway uh, and also bleeding during the laryngoscopy. Then there is tumor lysis syndrome, which can cause uh, other physiological effects. And also, a lot of times what happens is during a procedure, if we say we put in a tube and we give dexamethasone for uh, post-operative nausea vomiting or as an anti-edema, this also itself can cause tumor lysis if the mass is not removed. And also there is a risk of massive hemorrhage in this group. Uh, then uh, coming to... Max. So if you are doing a video assisted thoracoscopy, sometimes we want to isolate the lung if the mass is big. So there are these are the few options to isolate the lung. There is a double lumen tube, there is a bronchial blocker, there is a Fogarty catheter and endobronchial intubation. So this is how a double lumen tube looks. One end goes into the trachea and other end uh, stays in the uh, one end goes in the trachea and other, other end this end goes to the bronchus and this end goes to the trachea and wherever you want to isolate the lung we clamp that cell. So this is a picture of Fogarty's catheter. You can see it is going inside the mainstem bronchus and we inflate the Fogarty's catheter. So this is how we prevent. So one lung gets ventilated and the other it gets collapsed. It helps in uh, easier surgical excision. This is another way of isolating. This is called an iron blocker along with a multi-port adapter. Then uh, coming to post of pain relief, uh, we have few options like an epidural block, single shot or a catheter. We usually avoid if there is a history of intraspinal extension. There is something called as an ejector spiny block or a catheter. 
uh, if that uh, the if because of any reason these catheters are not possible, we can put the patient on IV opioid infusions, uh, or if the patient is old enough, we can put them on PCA pump and paracetamol and non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. So our experience over last one year was uh, we've had around 11 patients with uh, mediastinal mass. Majority of them were anterior mediastinal mass and large in size. So you can see there was succal compression in all the patients with anterior mediastinal mass and also ma and major vessel compression was also there. And we required cardiopulmonary bypass for almost, uh, you can say, uh, seven to eight of them and um, the majority complications what we encountered during interop period was hypertension desaturation and blood loss this is just an algorithm of how we usually proceed see if we have a suspected mass we do an, a routine blood test x-ray if there is signs and symptoms uh, which are positive predictive symptoms on ct eco pfr or whether they are absent if the positive uh, predictive factors are present, we discuss with the multi. There is a multi. There is an MPT. You can proceed under local anesthesia if possible. Because you should consider tumor reduction therapy if required. Proceed under GA with spontaneous ventilation and rigid bronchoscope, and we plan for a cardiorespiratory collapse. If these factors are not there, then it's a, it's pretty straightforward. You can proceed under local anesthesia if possible, or if required, we give general anesthesia. So the positive predictive symptoms are there's orthopnea, upper body edema, stridor, and these. These are your symptoms on eco. Mm -hmm. use for pericardial effusion, pulmonary artery outflow obstruction, ventricular dysfunction. Then on CT, we look for tracheal diameter narrowing, carinal or bronchial compression, SVC obstruction. And on positive predictive PEFR, if this is less than 50% of the predicted and supine, all these are high risk factors. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Herrick. Uh, Dr. Harik, you'll have to stop sharing your screen. Yeah, yeah. stop, stop, stop. Thank you. So now, uh, after the anesthesia uh, considerations are considered, we have Dr. Sajid Qureshi, who needs no introduction. Uh, so he's professor uh, in uh, Tata Memorial Hospital in Pediatric Surgical Oncology Department. He has done his fellowships uh, from uh, MR Children's Hospital, St. Jude's Hospital, uh, Memphis. And he'll be talking about open surgical approaches uh, used in pediatric uh, medicine masses. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Can I share the screen? Uh, quickly, I'll move on because I think there is uh, less of time. And uh, the next speaker, who is a very prolific speaker, Dr. Amos, we all are eager to hear from him. I'll just quickly tell about the surgical approaches uh, for the mediastinal tumors. Uh, this is what we see in a skygram, that is the X-ray. But this is actually not what is there exactly. The actual description of uh, the uh, mediastinal spaces, the anterior, middle, and the posterior are best seen with uh, 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 cross-sectional imaging, a CT scan. And here in these images, that the red is the anterior mediastinal uh, anterior mediastinum and the posterior mediastinum is the orange one. The surgeons, we are usually concerned with operating in the anterior and the posterior mediastinal structures. That's what I said. The middle mediastinum, it is mostly a diagnostic procedure and where uh, we look forward to uh, help from uh, uh, interventional radiologists to uh, get biopsies from difficult areas. Uh, so this is the anterior mediastinal tumors, the 4T, what we say. Uh, lymphomas, we are restricted for the diagnosis, and the neuroblastomas are the posterior uh, mediastinal tumors. Minimum investigation, when we plan a patient for surgery, these are the minimum investigation we do. And uh, the biopsies, as I said, the biopsies are required for solid tumors and most of the hematolymphoid tumors. Wherever possible, we look for places where outside the thorax where we can get a tissue diagnosis. Like Ram said, we look for the bone marrow, we look for the peripheral blood, 
we look for some lymph node in the neck which are away from the mediastinum those representative node whether the, those can be biopsies wherever possible a percutaneous biopsy especially the mediastinal anterior and the posterior mediastinal tumors uh, large tumors, we don't have any other lymph node uh, 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 areas for biopsy. You may be forced to do a surgical intervention. Uh, anterior mediastinotomy, a Chamberlain's procedure, is a very useful procedure. Mediastinoscopy, anterior mediastinoscopy rarely is possible, when, but whenever it is possible, it can be tried. Usually, the patients are too sick to have undergo a thoracoscopy or a thoracotomy. So, uh, procedures where we, uh, especially the hematolymphoid, where biopsy can be got without these procedures, those are best preferred. And in this day and age, I don't think we should be doing a thoracotomy for biopsying a posterior mediastinal mass or anterior, anterior mediastinal mass. A percutane bi biopsy uh, in solid tumors is usually. Uh, uh, available. So quickly moving on to the surgical approaches, the utility approach of to the thorax, which is the median, median sternotomy, uh, sternotomy approach. It's a, a, it's a very good approach and it is possible to dissect most of the anterior mediastinal tumors. There may be a little variation. I'll touch upon that later. For the posterior mediastinal tumors, we have the posterior thoracotomy. Uh, clamshell thoracotomy provide uh, access to both the thoracic cavity. And obviously, we have the thoracoscopic approach wherever required. A thoracoscopic approach is also useful. As I said, this is the median sternotomy approach. Uh, a nice incision right from the suprasternal notch till the xiphoid. Uh, care should be taken that the interclavicular ligament should be divided. I have seen people struggling to reach the behind the manubrium just because the interclavicular ligament has not been divided. Once you divide that, your finger will nicely insinuate beneath this, and then you can use the saw to divide the sternum. Once you open the mediastinum and the anterior mediastinum, the structure what you see is here. Uh, the pericardium, the tumor obviously will be there. Behind that will be the pericardium, the superior vena cava, the brachycephalic vein. And if possible, you have you should be able to see the, uh, the phrenic nerves and the lung hilum. Gently in this area, the dissection, and this is a very fibrous area. There is a very little blood, blood vessels here. So you can have a nice dissection can separate from the pericardium, can separate from the uh, um, uh, uh, the hilar structures also. And please, please make all efforts to uh, uh, safeguard the phrenic nerve. Those are very important. And it, usually if one is gone, people say nothing will happen, but we have had issues with uh, even paresis of the phrenic nerve. Uh, two important veins which we usually we uh, fail to notice those are the thymic veins. There are two vein thymic veins which drain directly into the brachycephalic vein. So if you encounter these thymic vein, you have to secure it very well. Now, it may be easy to dissect the tumor from the pericardium, but if there is a situation where you cannot separate it from the pericardium, pericardium is an expendable structure. You can excise the pericardium. Many of my cardiothoracic surgeon friends, they say that if you don't close the pericardium, if you don't repair the pericardium, nothing will happen. They Rather, they are scared of repairing the pericardium because if you close the pericardium, if there is an effusion, there may be a tamponade. So they are better off with leaving the pericardium open. Nothing will happen with that. But there are some instances, very large defect, where they have insisted uh, on using that. We have used a cellular, the bovine pericardium, which is now available to use uh, to repair the pericardium. Many a times it may not be possible to uh, dissect the vessels. And again, here your CBTS surgeon could be of great help. They may help you identify the superior vena cava. They may help you uh, put some catheters inside and put the patient on a cardiopulmonary bypass and you can have a safe resection. That's the tumor what we have removed. This was a thymolipoma. There may be instances where the tumor is completely encircling the structures, the blood vessel, which I said, 
On the left side, that's the superior vena cava, the brachycephalic vein, which are uh, draped over the mass. And by careful dissection, those vessels can be safeguarded. And if you notice very carefully on the left side, the phrenic nerve is also preserved in this case. Sometimes large mediastinal tumors, they may go on the back or large posterior mediastinal tumor, they may be so big that they come into the end, they may touch the sternum. In these cases also, you can take the median sternotomy approach and you can take a T extension, what you have, what you're seeing here, the two end, uh, 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 one, uh, this end, this end, these are the sternum. I've made a T incision here drop like this, this opens the entire thorax because uh, it is very difficult to go to the back, especially when you're concerned about the intraspinal extension, which was there in this patient. And there was this intraspinal extension, which, has been, uh, which was gently dissected. And we don't make a, a aggressive attempt in removing the intraspinal component, especially if it is an intermediate rest neuroblastoma or a ganglioneuroma, we prefer leaving the, even for high-risk neuroblastoma, we prefer leaving the disease there rather than risking the child with neurological deficit. That was the large tumor. And now you can see the T-shaped extension, which was there. The lung is now nicely fallen back. And this is the tumor, which was, remember, the thorax is not expandable like the abdomen. And you have to take a certain incision on the bone just to make the uh, cavity a little wider. Uh, this is the surgical defect. A lot of clips we have used. One important thing, especially in the posterior media system, I want to bring to your attention is that if you happen to see this whitish structure behind the outer, you better clip it. This is the thoracic duct. Because it may appear that we have seen the thoracic duct and it is fine, but a small injury in the thoracic duct will make your good surgery a bad surgery because there will be tremendous amount of chylothorax. Uh, the posterior mediastinal tumors, the standard posterior lateral thoracotomy, uh, here you may have uh, adhesions to the lung. Gentle, majority of these adhesions are flimsy adhesion and it is possible that you can separate those adhesions from the tumor. Once those adhesions are out, you can dissect the tumors widely, and this is how the surgical defect will be after removal. Uh, be very liberal in excising the pleura. Nothing will happen if you have taken a little more of the pleura. And sometimes the tumor may extend down, like in this case, this is a, a, a lower thoracic, uh, lower posterior mediastinal tumor. Don't hesitate to divide the diaphragm. You can divide the diaphragm because it can be easily repaired. And you can have a nice exposure up in the lower part and under vision, you can excise the tumor. Uh, an important consideration here is if you happen to see here, those are the thoracic uh, posterior intercostal vessels. Now, this area, especially the 9, 10, and 11, and 12 area, this is a little uh, 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 critical area because here is the artery of Adam Kivik's. From where is this artery of adding to which arises? It's a question, but usually it is said it's in the 9, 10, and 11, 12 uh, thoracodors, uh, thoracic uh, uh, intercostal joint. And here in these cases, usually on the left side, the artery is there. But any uh, uh, aggressive dissection here, aggressive ligation of the posterior intercostal vessel here at this point may risk uh, uh, the chance of having a neurological deficit in the form of paraplegia. So you have to be a little careful. Uh, uh, special areas in the mediastinum, the cervicothoracic region, especially the cervicothoracic neuroblastoma, the approach is similar to the apical tumor lung cancers, what we have, and there are different approaches what we use. My uh, favorite approach is the Grunenwald approach, the cervicomanubrial sternal approach, and of course, there, this is the Darterville approach, which is obsolete now. And then there is the trapdoor approach. Uh, this is the Grunenwald approach. The incision courses along the sternum astroid, the stuprasternal notch, the manubrium sterni, and then curves on the second rib. 
and you can take an L-shaped incision on the manubrium. A manubrotomy is done. You can excise the first postal cartilage, what you see here, and the entire clavicle and the manubrium piece can be lifted like a, a wing. And you have this area which can be dissected and your tumor it will be exactly behind these vessels. That's the stellate ganglion region where the cervicothoracic neuroblastomas usually originate. Careful dissection and you can dissect all the vessel. Again, you have to remember that the phrenic nerve is in the vicinity and you should be very careful of the phrenic nerve. The closure is very simple. Once you drop it, a simple ethibon suture or rarely, rarely we have used steel wires for this, but ethibon suture or one number proline suture is also fine to close the defect. Here, the dissection can extending can be extended up into the thorax. That's the vertebral artery which has been dissected and it can be dissected right till the uh, C6 transverse process where it enters in the foramen transverse area. Uh, a further extension of the cervicothoracic approach is the trapdoor approach. It's nothing but instead of the second rib, we go into the third or the fourth intercostal space with the manubrotomy and a partial sternotomy. The entire flap can be lifted like a door. That's why the trapdoor approach. With these two last images, I would like to wind up and I, I would like to give time more to my friend Amos. To, I'm going to hear from him about his minimal access surgery. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sajid, for the informa informative session. Uh, I will be, uh, I'll be sharing screen to introduce Dr. Ms. Dr. Saha will help me out on this. Is my screen visible? Not yet. I'm, I'm stopping the presentation from my end. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Now you can share the screen. Dr. Amos, thank you for joining in. Uh, we'll be all uh, very, I mean, waiting to, to listen to you. Uh, Dr. Zaha, please introduce uh, Dr. Amos. I share. Yeah. Uh yeah. Uh, good evening, Dr. Amos from India. He's a, sir, he's a professor in KK Women and Children's Hospital. He's an MBBS followed by MRCS, then in uh, then FMS, and he's in pediatric surgical oncology as well as the pediatric surgery in mini invasive surgery. He is the principal investigator for the Viva Cage. Pediatric Solid Tumor Research Laboratory and Chairman of the Viva Pediatric Brain and Solid Tumor Pro Program. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Um, and thanks, uh, Monica, for this uh, invitation. Sajid, thank you for that excellent talk. Uh, so I'll jump in and wrap up the last presentation of the evening. We're going to be talking about the role of minimally invasive surgery in uh, pediatric mediastinal tumors. So Broadly, this is going to be uh, what I'll cover in a couple of short minutes, a bit of a background. I'd like to spend a bit of time talking about MIS considerations and our approach, diagnostic approach to the MARE, and then uh, talk about some applications in cases and then wrap up with some future advances. So we know that this field is rapidly expanding and it's been limited for the longest time because of instrumentation. Uh, but really, in the last 20 years, I think we've seen uh, much advances in our understanding of technical advances as well in the application of pediatric cancer. So really the benefit, uh, this goes uh, uh, without too much saying that there is a rapid recovery and this is important in our patients because it returns them to therapy quickly. I think the other unique thing in the chest is that it gives access to unique areas and this is the case elsewhere as well. Uh, the last thing to mention, and I'll try and give an illustration at the end, uh, is the use of MIS in think, some of these procedures. So we're not we hope to do an entire procedure uh, with the scope all open, and really we can try a hybrid uh, of both, right? Um, <clears throat> one thing to mention is that uh, uh, there is also a physiological effect, and the anesthetists, I think, of all appreciate this the most, and that's uh, a reduced uh, cytokines and inflammatory response because uh, of the, the reduction in incisions. Uh, however, there are some controversies that remain. 
and the main one pertains to dissemination of tumor cells. The evidence for this is not very strong, but the presence of some uh, a rather concerning case reports in the literature, then I think uh, befalls us to, to you know, approach this still with an open mind. I think until our data is a little bit more certain to point us one way or the other. The advantages of using a thoracoscope uh, uh, are, are quite obvious. Smaller incisions uh, reduce pain, but also improve uh, cosmetic appearance, which especially uh, in our adolescent group and teenagers uh, is something that they view of uh, much more importance, right, than, than perhaps uh, an older person might. Uh, the improved visualization, I think, is something that we don't appreciate well enough. The fact that you've got magnification on the scope far more times than you're able to ever achieve uh, with a pair of loops. Uh, that does increase our precision and also increases our concerns, right, about things like blood loss. And lastly, uh, navigating pulmonary adhesions, which can be uh, very bloody and difficult when they're done open. I think it's equally important for us to discuss when not to use the thoracoscopic uh, approach. And I'll stress a little bit more about this later. And this, these are, are, are situations when you have a small patient, a large mass, or lack of expertise or equipment. Uh, this is obvious. This is an image to scale. Uh, you see a classic 45mm stapler there, thoracoscopic grasper, next to a chest of a two-month-old. And you can imagine there isn't very much space to navigate those instruments in that limited chest cavity. So let's think about this in the context of approach, right? So I, I usually share this algorithm uh, with our trainees when we talk about uh, approach to a mediastinal mass in general. And uh, you can see how when we go down the algorithm, we ask uh, a diagnostic question, is this benign or malignant? And we use malignancy risk prediction to tell what best to do. We use a management question to think about intervention. And this is where then it starts to stratify. And, and when we share this, in some other settings, uh, uh, this comes from QDC algorithm, we have to think uh, about uh, emergent settings where the patient is in emergency, uh, as well as the availability of resource. And I put a little red circle around the sweet spot here, which I think is, is, is perhaps the only place that we would uh, advocate for use of minimally invasive surgery in a mediastinal mass. So just look at that column. And that's in the setting where we're really looking at just a biopsy or, or, or a resection up front. Uh, and there is sufficient resource in the center that patient's being cared for so that we do not put the patient at risk. Uh, and, and this uh, is something to stress. Uh, we talked about this in the anesthesia lecture, the need to pay attention to the so-called Schamberger's box, which is uh, the, the cross-section of risk factors which puts the patient at highest risk of uh, perioperative uh, complications. And in minimally invasive surgery, we want to be on the other end. We want to be in the green B box, uh, where the patient has got good peak respiratory flow rate, uh, an open tracheal area, uh, and, and we know we can do this safely uh, with the stress also of the pneumothorax, right? Uh, last thing also is to say that when do we apply this when we have other diagnostic options in the approach? Uh, and if you look across this chart here, and I mentioned a bit about this in the chat, the yield rates from diagnosis from different uh, tissue as well as uh, fluids uh, uh, vary, right? And the fact that we get tissue from a, a minimally invasive approach uh, gives us the best advantage from the recovery standpoint, as well as from the diagnostic standpoint. And we pan this out across a various disease types. You can see uh, how in some modalities, uh, uh, like a image guided needle biopsy or a thoracosynthesis, this falls away very rapidly in comparison. So in summary, uh, it's a decision-making process. You know, we ask those key questions about diagnosis and management, we need to be aware of potential emergencies and choose our biopsy approach appropriately and customizing that to our local situation. Let me go into some examples uh, in mediastinal masses where we can appropriately apply a minimally invasive surgery in the anterior, uh, uh, really biopsies and resections where suitable, and in the posterior, similarly with the pathologies that we discussed in the earlier lectures. But I would add to that also some of the benign pathologies where this may be uh, highly uh, useful. Uh, we need to be careful, again, of anesthetic safety. And one of the limitations here is when you have a large mass. And I would contest that because we, there is no point resecting a mass entirely and still have to make a big cut to take it out. So I, I think we need to be judicious as well sometimes when we listen to uh, 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 presentations that advocate minimally invasive surgery, uh, but perhaps not with an appropriate application. So uh, uh, this is a study we did some years ago. 
uh, one of our fellows looked at this aspect and your patients traditionally with more than 50% tracheal compression should not undergo general anesthesia. Uh, we did demonstrate that in an appropriate risk-guided fashion, you can apply this safely in some settings, but it does really depend on the acuity of the setting as well as the risk uh, uh, assessment. Uh, so I'm going to show you a case in neuroblastoma where this is uh, applicable. Um, this helps us avoid a lot of the big thoracotomy uh, complications and really should be a case where we're also thinking about the disease uh, and think about this perhaps where you're dealing with less aggressive bio uh, biology or a case where uh, the, the clearance uh, does not make a difference. This is a seven-month-old female uh, with a posterior mediastinal mass. You can see in the upper right, a little knob there that was MIBG added. It's small enough in this case that we can anticipate squeezing it out through a port uh, through the rib spaces. And so a, 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 a CT was done to assess this. It showed no image-defined risk factors, no penetration of the uh, 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 neural foramina. Uh, and this is the MIBG avidity that's shown. Patients put in a lateral position and we can get a nice and high uh, around with ports decided around the scapula, right? So this is how we approach to lead the patient slightly forward, use gravity to help weigh the lungs down and then we get a nice view uh, out towards the back. And again, demonstrating the magnification that we can achieve uh, with the thoracoscope in this case. Um, and you can see a nice expansion of the lung uh, uh, on post-operative day one with a quick recovery from the patient, in this case, uh, with the child going back the next day after surgery. So um, in thoracic sarcomas, this is another application. I'm going to show you a case at the other end of the spectrum. Uh, we can do this in malignant tumors as well as non-malignant bony tumors, such as mesenchymal hematomas. And I'll show you an example of a hybrid approach. This is a 13-year-old female with a very much extensive uh, a disease. You can see the rib destruction uh, and uh, a, a white out of chest. Now, after the neoadjuvant chemotherapy, we see a reduction in the size of the tumor. But what's the, uh, pertinent to point out is that the tumor still extends to the vertebral column. And that poses a, a challenge with regard to the resection plan because we're really looking at a rib resection and with a posterior disarticulation as well, going up to the costal vertebral joint. And that excess is going to anticipate it to be difficult, especially because we're coming from open approach from the outside of the patient. So this is us doing a hybrid approach. This is the uh, uh, a surgery done the other way. This is the open converted to thoracic uh, thoracoscopic approach rather than a scope converted to an open approach, right? So we, we gain access, establish our osteotomies on the ribs, and then we put the scope in uh, and, and perform uh, the posterior dissection, removing the lung as well as clearing it off of the vertebra uh, using the scope, which we can't reach uh, from the outside. And so there's some appearance that you see clearing off the, the adhesions between the lung, chest wall, uh, before, then we clear our margins from the inside and complete the resection and the reconstruction. And that's the specimen there, then allowing us to get all the way back to the costal vertebral joint. So in this case, uh, this was an Ewing sarcoma indeed, and we were able to get uh, uh, clear margins, uh, albeit close case. Uh, I'm going to wrap up with a, a, a mention about ICG. I think this is relevant to talk about. In those cyanine greens, fluorescent dye, detectable uh, with a near infrared camera and uh, there's preferential uptake and retention uh, by tumor cells because of the leaky lymphatics. And the advent of ICG equipped minimally invasive camera systems, uh, the most popular ones by Stort, Stryker, uh, uh, now have sort of uh, allowed for a plethora of applications of ICG in various cancer situations. So here's an example, uh, not so much in a cancer situation, but how we use it in lymphatics, right? So uh, uh, Dr. Sajid talked about this uh, 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 and the risk of injuring the thoracic duct. Here we have a 12-year-old female with a cystic lesion crossing the midline in the posterior mediastinum. And uh, here's an image of us injecting ICG after the resection is done. And you see the dye going through the venous uh, uh, phase, going out into the tissue. And then if you pay attention to the lymphatics at the edge of our incision, the, the ICG starts to collect there and it points out to us where those cut lymphatics and where the thoracic duct is sitting after we've excised this big uh, um, cystic posterior mediastinal uh, mass, right? And that allows us then to do uh, a repair uh, of and oversold the lymphatics in order to uh, prevent, you know, what would be a, a very uh, a protracted post-operative coyote. Yeah, so that's an application uh, of how we would, would use that in the thoracic uh, situation. In summary, we're looking at really a rapidly developing field. 
that I would say is that hampered by technical limitations in the present day compared to perhaps 10 or 20 years ago. Advantages and limitations are clear in application of pediatric cancer, and I advocate here that actually we need more data to help us know when to apply this in our patients and when not to. Um, we see successes with good case selection and, of course, improvements in operative experience. And a brief mention about future advances, because I think the technology and the clinical experience we begin to gain uh, will help us uh, uh, do a lot more. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir. It was a very uh, beautiful presentation. And thank you for your, sharing your time and uh, expertise. So we'll uh, take a few questions. We have two cases which we are going to discuss. Though they are covered, we'll just take five minutes to uh, take those questions. Uh, So this is a uh, first case. A five-year-old child had presented with respiratory infection. Uh, the pediatrician didn't test x-ray where the shadow was seen. So this is the x-ray which is being shared. Uh, Dr. Ram, would you like to tell us how to proceed from here? Yeah. Uh, so uh, here we have a five-year-old child who's come with uh, a respiratory infection. Don't know whether it might even be an upper respiratory. We don't know. But incidentally, when in the workup, uh, it has been picked up that child has got a chest X-ray done and then it shows this. So it's a common uh, kind of a scenario that we encounter. It looks like there's a, a mass which is predominantly, which is there on the right uh, uh, hemithorax involving the upper uh, uh, right hemithorax and also involving onto the uh, card, uh, mediastinum like merging with the cardiac shadow. So uh, this looks more like a solid uh, lesion. So would proceed further uh, with uh, a further uh, the CT imaging for contrast and CT. So we did this MRI. So there's a lesion which is seen. So when you have this kind of a lesion, what, what investigation do we do further? So... Uh, definitely ancillary investigations uh, uh, would be performed if whenever we have this high suspicion of a neoplastic etiology. But honestly, like how often do we think about neoplastic etiology in regu regular day-to-day -day pediatric practices, something. So we, the, what we end up seeing is uh, the child would go for a cross-sectional imaging rather than, uh, you know, working up more and more for uh, other causes because here clearly doesn't have constitutional symptoms. CVC must have been done, peripherals may have to rule out any acute leukemia. And then if there is no such abnormal cells uh, suggestive of any hematolymphoid malignancy, then would go for a cross-sectional imaging. Okay. So we were told that it is a neurogenic uh, tumor. The radiologist uh, told us this. So we did. Um, so the plan, do we need to do a biopsy or what do we do? Dr. Sadi, Dr. Amos, anyone if you can uh, just uh, say a word about this. Would you want to do a biopsy in this? A biopsy? Sanji, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Uh, we, we need more information. Uh, I am not seeing images, uh, just the X-ray we are seeing on this uh, yeah, uh, okay. screen. Yes. Is my screen visible because I'm trying to show MRI films of this? Uh... No, no, it's not. Okay, I'll, I'll just share it again then. Just give me a minute. Is it visible now? Yes, it is visible. Yes, sir. Uh, this is a very nice, nicely circumscribed mass without any intraspinal, or is there an intraspinal extension? Not certain. We need to see more images. But if it is a well circumscribed mass like this, uh, the, the, the option is to go ahead for an excision biopsy or to wait and watch also, depending on where is your uh, uh, inclination to. If it is a neuroblastoma, this is a very small neuroblastoma, maybe a low-risk neuroblastoma. We have several. I'm just giving you the possibilities. I'm not telling you you should be doing this. Taking all those things into consideration, a well-circumscribed mass like this can be subjected to an excision biopsy also. But at the same time, if the child is absolutely asymptomatic, then there may be a case to discuss further about 
the characteristic of this lesion is it fitting into a neuroblastoma is there any other thing and if it indeed is a uh, radiologically fitting into neuroblastoma then there may be a case for observation also but before observation uh, a valid question will be would you not want to know what is this can you not do a biopsy so i have kept everything open it it is a clinical clinical call the clinician's call to what to do next a uh, asymptomatic child with a very small localized mass without any intraspinal extension the radiologist feel it is not looking that ominous the option of observation is available if it is like a symptomatic mass and this is resectable may go for an excision biopsy rather than a core biopsy amis what do you have to say yeah uh, sajid entirely agree with the, your considerations there um i think uh, it is a clinical judgment based on uh, tumor markers as well as symptoms and you know if you have the luxury of serial imaging whether there's been change I, i think what i want to mention here is that if the decision algorithm goes all the way down and eventually you say that yes uh we're going to want to resect this uh um, then i would say that the 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 data says that that's okay to go ahead um if you look at inrgss this patient does not have a uh, image defined risk factor uh and so uh you 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 have green light to go ahead and do a, a upfront uh, resection um um the the if you still use the old cog uh, approach then this uh, can still be a, a stage 1 um or under the ocog system uh, in in order for you to to resect i, I would just uh, um exercise some caution with the um uh, uh, the the way the tumor might be sitting against the innominate vein and subclavian vein uh that's uh, typically where something like this would would run into trouble uh, especially if individuals try to approach this with a thoracoscope because you get past the most of the tumor and you onto the last bit and then you make a hole in the so we have option to excise also and to observe also in this patient so if this patient had uh, this one second so we're going for surgery and it came out to be as gangrenous neuroblastoma everyone uh, so if this patient had intraspinal extension so uh, yeah yeah so so then that would be an image defined risk factor um and while there's nothing in the inrg ss guidelines to say that you can't operate um up front on an you know on an idrf l2 tumor um i think once you see intraspinal extension one would err into uh, just doing a biopsy and and getting the histology first so would you be comfortable with open or a uh, uh, thoracoscopic uh, if there is an intraspinal extension um <laughs> yeah maybe i'd like to hear from the the surgeons uh, uh, uh you know the indian surgeons and and you know in vasa ji what 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 is what is your preference in your setting there i prefer an open approach i'm not a big fan of the thoracoscopic approach but i may be wrong this is a personal bias but definitely i haven't done uh, inter- for my open intraspinal extension i rarely go ahead with the uh, removal of that component i i wonder w- what you do in a thoracoscopic approach knowing that there is an intraspinal extension yeah i i think uh, uh, uh looking at it a uh, thoracoscopic approach for biopsy would be okay um i i would caution that yes uh, sometimes we worry that we cause edema and swelling of the mass uh through the biopsy process or cause a hematoma in there and the tumor swells and then actually precipitates a spinal event so i think we we have to take caution uh, as well depending on the 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 exact nature of the the intraspinal uh, portion yeah but but that's just for the biopsy approach okay so uh, probably if it was uh, not intraspinal expan- expansion so we probably would be observing it so dr ram if it uh, it is an intraspinal extension we are leaving something behind so would you like to give chemotherapy So this is something which uh, we do end up seeing a lot in practice uh, with uh, when we practice so yes uh, we do not treat that uh, leftover intraspinal extension rather we go by the practice that we need to uh, achieve something like more than 50% reduction in this uh, good risk uh, neuroblastomas be it low risk or intermediate risk so we 
only use chemotherapy to reduce these uh, baseline symptoms of uh, neural deficits and to make the surgery possible. So probably we'll just give two to three cycles, go for surgery, and then we're not going to take a call based upon whether it's intraspinal component, which is left, rather we'll go by the extent of resection. Okay. So one thing I wanted to ask, it's five years old, but a kid with a small lesion, uh, if we are observing, will uh, do we need NVIC amplification to see uh, MLP or do we need to do NVIC amplification at least if we are observing? Uh, definitely when the diagnosis is ganglion neuroblastoma, uh, nodular or even a neuroblastoma, then we are, uh, we are definitely going to rule out the NVIC amplification by doing FISH or by MLP. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Zaha, will you like to take second question? Are you there? Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, the, good evening, everyone. So, I'm where I'm practicing from there. I picked up this case. So here, the 13 years boy presented to us with a history of cough since four months, and though not associated with any breathing difficulty, but there is a occurrence of hemoptysis two to three times since last one month. No other constitutional symptoms. With this feature and some investigation, the child uh, came to us on examination. Uh, there is a no breathing difficulty and there is a features of client filters. It's a long uh, stature with the, all the feet and the uh, hands deformities. Though in this kind of thing, we go for thinking in the mind uh, Maybe you are dealing with a, some kind of a neoplastic uh, thing. And that we already discussed, these are the baseline investigations. And with a biopsy report from the outside, that I'm not going to tell this moment. And this is the investigations we caught up. I again, got the things. The LDH is 2288. AFP is less than 1.3. And beta ECG was 385, which is slightly raised. Uh, Dr. Ram, uh, uh, what we do from now about that? So as you said, the patient is uh, having clinical phenotype of uh, Kleinfelter's and then you have a mediastinal mass uh, which you have picked up and there is elevated beta HCG. This gives us a diagnosis clear cut that this child is having a mediastinal germ cell tumor and uh, beta HCG of this number is definitely significant, although AFP is low. So we can, we can uh, totally obviate the need for biopsy and go ahead and start the child on uh, chemotherapy after adequate staging investigations. That is uh, imaging of the thorax and abdomen with a contrast in MCT would do. Yeah, so, so we we'll start with the uh, chemotherapy regimen. Uh, uh, once we just see the scans, just look at the lungs and everything, and then mostly we, it should be okay. We will be able to give PEB or a JEB, whichever is the practice uh, at the center. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so with this uh, CT scan and as well as the uh, marker, Though this child presented with us with outside biopsy, which suggests of teratoma, but in our practice, sir, as well as the RAM, whether we should do biopsy or we should not do biopsy, because we have already the biochemical markers. RAM. Oh yeah, yeah. So usually, for uh, it's one of the pediatric malignancy where we can diagnose with uh, with uh, hundred percent certainty that it is a. Uh, 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 a germ cell tumor based on both, of course, the uh, tumor markers and also imaging also being consistent that it is a germ cell tumor. So we can safely uh, avoid biopsy and it is not going to add more information as we know that germ cell tumors are quite heterogeneous. We might target whichever component uh, we're going to target. So it's not going to add more to our uh, treatment plan. Rather, we'll go ahead. Uh, with uh, management. So here it is a mediastinal tumor. In other cases where if it is not a mediastinal tumor, but anywhere else, so we might even consider upfront surgery also. So that's why uh, usually a biopsy is not required. If it was a tumor which was having features of uh, a germ cell tumor, like there is a heterogeneous areas with showing cystic spaces and uh, you might see even fat and uh, other structures which can uh, you know, uh, push us more towards uh, a germ cell tumor, but the tumor markers 
aren't elevated, then yes. So you can uh, proceed with further uh, investigations, uh, either a resection or a biopsy. But once again, as I am saying, like if you see chunky calcifications pad, you would think it was a it is a mature teratoma. But, and uh, all putting it in clinical context, less less likely that we'll find like a only mature teratoma presenting as a mediastinal germ cell tumor at this age. So yeah. So these are the areas where you can think of biopsy is when you have tumor markers completely normal and then the imaging is consistent with germ cell tumor. The next slide. Yes, ideally uh, for a choriocarcinoma, you will yes. have to do an MRI brain as a adequate staging investigation. So uh, this might even be a mixed uh, um, uh, GCT, but definitely beta HCG is quite elevated. So we might consider, we will consider. And next, uh, uh, the question for Sir and uh, Dr. Amos. Whether we think for the upfront surgery or in interval surgery following new adjuvant chemo? MSU first. <laughs> um, I, I, I think in this case, uh, it's a weighing out of risk. Uh, what I would be most concerned about is the right pulmonary vein uh, in this patient. And uh, with the manipulation and the anesthesia, uh, what I would be most concerned about is, is loss or interruption of the pulmonary circulation that can result in collapse. Um, so I would advocate to try and reduce this uh, with neoadjuvant chemotherapy if we know that this uh, has a chance of response. So we know that germ cell tumors tend to be quite responsive. But the caveat, I think, is that the uh, can, can be resistant. Okay, so we uh, decided in our tumor board to go ahead with the new adjuvant chemotherapy. What we follow here, we usually go for the PIB and we can put it as a stage three extragonadal mediastinal choriocarcinoma and non metastatic. So it is a kind of COG restratification, which is kind of high risk. So we usually go ahead with you, everyone. We usually go ahead with the three cycles of PAPE, then we go for response assessment, surgery, and followed by complete the adjuvant chemotherapy. But here there is a, in the post two cycles of PAPE, the child came to our emergency with a tachycardia and tachypnea. Though there is a uh, good lock uh, fall of the tumor marker 3.8, and with this situation, we go for the uh, scan to see what is happening, what was the knee, uh, what is the problem with the gut, uh, boy. And we found out this is the scan. So, uh, though I have only put a one block, but if you, if you go see the whole scan, that there is a, though it's telling that radiologist is telling that it's a grossly stable disease, but on imaging when we compare with the baseline scan, it looks like it is increased. And there is also the atelectasis change and there is the effusion. So next slide. So now the question is for the all, uh, for the uh, pediatric oncologist as well as to both the surgeons. So how we go ahead from this situation? Ramp first uh, regarding this uh, growing teratoma syndrome. Uh, so I have a very little to add. So when we are giving chemotherapy, there is a good biochemical response, but radiological or clinical response is it not fitting in with that. That means that this tumor has got both chemo responsive and un unresponsive elements. So the chemo responsive elements have come down and that is in a way helping the uh, unresponsive elements to uh, grow or expand. So that is mostly a teratoma, teratomatous component which is causing uh, symptoms, uh, which uh, can be seen and which is like labeled as growing teratoma syndrome. So that's how, uh, uh, so the next plan would be not to push more chemo or some other second line chemo, rather to go with a surgical approach. Uh, over to sir and Dr. Amos. Yes. Sir. Uh, I, I, I think uh, what Ram has said is uh, uh, very clear. This is a uh, 
that erythematous component which is now remaining, this is not going to respond further. Rather, it may grow further. Uh, what the scan you showed, there is some metal actasis. There is some uh, reduced uh, capacity of the right lung. And we all know that this is a mechanical cause. And uh, enough chemotherapy, two chemotherapy has been given. I think that is enough to have a good amount of fibrosis. And this patient should be subjected to surgery. The surgery should be taken in a, 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 a setup which has, a, a, if possible, if required, a cardiothoracic surgeon is also available because the pulmonary vein which was there is a little bit concerning. And uh, uh, you should be ready for vascular dissection, pericardial resection, and the last thing, if there is a need for actual help of the CBT surgeon, it, it will be really useful. Uh, anesthesia concerns, Dr. Harik. Hi. So anesthesia concern, uh, concerns are uh, more or less the same. I uh, the CT scan where we go back to the CT, you could see the airway is kind of displaced to the right side. If I'm not mistaken, that's the <clears throat> area which has been displaced to the right side. And so there can be a possibility of difficulty in ventilation after putting the tube. And as Sir said, we would need the cardiothoracic surgeon and all the surgical team on uh, standby in case there is a problem with ventilation for an emergency sternotomy and removal of mass and also probably to go on CP bypass immediately. Other than that, uh, the other consultations would be excessive bleeding. Uh, probably patient may end up in DLC because of excessive bleeding and massive blood transfusion. That is another major cause about it. So uh, where I am working, it is a new hospital and we are always, uh, uh, this kind of cases, we always talk with the SER and the team which is there are working in the Tata Mumbai. So with the situation when the child was a little bit settled, we shift him to Tata Memorial Hospital Mumbai. And rightly said, sir, so these are the facility we don't have at present in our hospital. So this, hosp uh, this case actually operated in SRCC Mumbai where Dr. Harik is working. And though the cardiopulmonary bypass surgeon was also there, but actually didn't require, we get out of this case without the putting the child in the CPB. So next slide, please. So this is the features we found at, at the time of surgery, the mediastinal mass, the densely adherent to the SVC, pericardium and round uh, lung parenchyma was collapsed. So went ahead with the median sternotomy with right anterior thoracotomy in fifth intercostal space, what already sir spoken about the kind of T-shaped incision because it is adherent to the posterior limb which is not amenable to go with the anterior approach. And mass dissected carefully from the subclavian vein and SVC and mass dissected free from the lateral thoracic wall. So the biopsy report, next slide. So final h came as a mature teratoma. No choreocarcino component was there, which is already the chemo already worked on it. And from there, Dr. Ram, and sir, you want to add something? You will have to complete chemotherapy, uh, uh, considering that this is a mixed uh, germ cell tumor kind of uh, picture. It, uh, you would ideally complete the four cycles of uh, uh, PEB, even if you go by the COG classification for this child. Yeah. So uh, thank you. The till that child is... Uh, following up with us, the last visit on 19th of last month, AFP is 3.7 and beta ACG is normal within normal limit. So the one important thing, a lot of patients we get here with the biopsy, but we don't see the biochemical marker. If you see the markers and the extreme imaging, then no need for the go for the biopsy. It will already suggest, but still we see this kind of thing. So. Uh, uh, Monica. Dr. Monica. I have stopped sharing my screen. We'll uh, take the questions in the chat box. Yeah. 
I think most of the questions have been answered. Anyone from the audience wants to ask any question? Yeah, no? Monica and Dr. Batankar, can I ask? Yes, sir. Uh, yes. So my question is to Ram, medical oncologist. Uh, seeing the last case especially, can you tell us what features do you look for where, it, where you think that the tumor is likely to be responsive to chemotherapy, two doses, new adjuvant, followed by surgery? Uh, because uh, many times we see that the patient does not benefit from new adjuvant chemotherapy and when the mass was resectable in the first instance. I hope you got my question. Yes, yes, I do get your question. Uh, so, uh, so first thing is, Germ cell tumors, we do consider them as chemoresponsive. That is what we see in practice. If we are not seeing certain response in a particular patient, then we should understand that along with the chemoresponsive elements, the yolk sac and the choriocarcinoma elements or other malignant components, there is also some amount of teratomatous tumor in it. So that is why you might be facing these challenges. So looking at the imaging upfront, you can tell that it looks in favor of germ cell tumor, but there is nothing like you can say that this germ cell tumor has these components unless you're finding like mature elements like fat or, you know, chunky calcifications, you know that there is definitely some teratomatous component in it. You should always uh, add, put things together. One is the tumor markers and the second thing is the imaging and the clinical condition. So considering all this, putting all this together in this particular patient, we do have to give a trial of chemotherapy because uh, we are not going to achieve R0 resection in this patient upfront and there would be a lot of morbidity and you would expect that the chemo to respond. If it does not happen, like in this scenario where you see a growing teratoma, it is not a common scenario. It is a, a case which uh, Dr. Saha had put up, but it is not a common scenario. But still, I do understand where this question is coming from because in mediastinal uh, germ cell tumors, we don't see as easy as it is in other uh, germ cell tumors, the, uh, the possibility of getting this resection even post chemotherapy. But chemotherapy trial uh, is ideally given for all germ cell tumors with elevated tumor markers, uh, unless it is like really looking a resective, uh, resectable upfront, which is less common that we end up finding such patients. In Thank you. Okay. Monica, can I give, give a follow-up follow follow -on question if you don't mind? Yes, sir, please. Yeah. So Dr. Ram, See, we work in resource uh, poor settings. We don't have so much access to biopsies, multiple imaging. So sometimes we get these big tumors in the chest. Even in Will's tumor, we get the big tumors. And uh, what we do is we go in and we de debulk them. And then we get the medical oncologist to come in. So what is your uh, experience with uh, thoracic uh, tumors which have been debulked? and then undergone surgery rather than primary uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by uh, 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 total surgery. Uh, yes, so constraints are definitely something which we do see in day-to-day -day practice in LMIC. So uh, the first thing is when the child presents with a huge uh, thoracic mass and then in a lot of distress and in a poor condition. So uh, one might err towards doing a debulking surgery to both relieve the symptoms and also to get the diagnosis. It happens. I'm not saying this is the uh, standard of care. It, it might happen in a, in a peripheral uh, center. But yeah. We need to understand that a proportion of them in pediatrics are actually lymphomas or leukemias, which do not warrant such kind of surgery. This might actually make them, you know, make their uh, definitive treatment delayed. So it might actually push things back because the child needs to recover from this kind of uh, thoracic surgery, sternotomy. So it's not uncommon. Like we see, do see antimedias, masses, lymphomas with this huge, uh, like the like a sternotomy done, debulking done and all that. So it might delay the definitive treatment. So ideally, we need to stabilize these patients uh, by uh, doing the basics ABCs. So stabilizing the airway, starting steroids, and then simultaneously looking up with all the things, parameters to rule out the hematolymphoid malignancy. And then if it turns out to be hematolymphoid, might as well, you should definitely start treatment. Then coming to solid tumors also, debulking is definitely not helpful. Most of the solid tumors uh, that we see, be it germ cell or even sarcoma or any sarcomas which are coming from the uh, coming in this in this pediatric age group, 
the neuroblastoma usually it's better that we finish the workup and then take a call whether it is uh, upfront operable or not so all put together i can understand the difficulties like you end up having a patient with resort in a resource constrained setting and you might uh, uh, end up uh, having to do this kind of uh, surgeries but definitely uh, not recommended and we should try to you know strengthen our systems where we, these children can uh, reach the oncology centers at the earliest to start their definitive treatment and finish their work up. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, everyone. I just saw that uh, Dr. Emma's has already answered uh, the queries which were there. And uh, there's one question which is just left. If uh, In the superior media sinus syndrome patient, once the symptoms subside, uh, patients are stabilized and biopsy is done. Is it okay to stop dex dexamethasone while waiting for the diagnosis? A confirmation? As so this happens a lot uh, when the, the child presents to a center and then there, there, there's a starting of DEXA, uh, the dexamethasone steroids, and then there is some relief in symptoms. The biopsy was done and the biopsy uh, not always uh, uh, ends up being a, a, a representative specimen or, you know, even if it is a representative specimen, the turnaround time is quite long in periphery. The samples might actually go somewhere else to get the uh, immunohistochemistry done and all that. This we do encounter in a country which is so large and you see such diverse uh, economic uh, this landscape in a country like us so uh, ideally we uh, uh, the this there is no clear answer to this question but definitely if it is a leukemia if it's a leukemia the, the steroid would continue during the first one month of the treatment so it wouldn't it wouldn't stop if it turns out to be some other tumor apart from leukemia be it a non-hodgkin's lymphoma or a hodgkin's lymphoma or if it is a solid tumor the 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 thing is the definitive treatment would have started in five to seven days time so if you are stuck in periphery where you cannot start the definitive treatment and you're waiting for the diagnosis and it's taking longer time Yes, you might actually continue the steroids uh, longer than what it is expected, but definitely even we try to, you know, hasten this process, fasten this process and get the diagnosis at the earliest uh, so that we can start the definitive treatment. One important thing here is practically steroids are started, the lymph, uh, the uh, mediastinal mass, uh, you know, kind of vaporizes and you don't see a mediastinal mass. Most likely, this is going to be a T a ALL or a T lymphoblastic lymphoma because that's the only tumor of all the possibilities which actually melts with steroids alone rather than other uh, possible diagnosis. So you may not have any tissue, but you, then you should actually think that this must be a TLDL. Okay. Um, in the end, I'd like to thank everyone, Dr. Sadi, Dr. Amos, uh, Dr. Harik and Dr. Ram to be, uh, give your time for this uh, presentation. Uh, we'll hopefully see you, see you in the next one. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Good show, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Hoping to meet you again on the platform very soon for the next sessions. So with all your due permissions, we are closing the room here. Thank you.